Hi, welcome to the webinar today. Hi, hi everybody. Um, how did that start? Um, I think I like when I'm on stage. I like to be the audience to be happy because then they will remember more. So sometimes I tell jokes, good ones, bad ones. I don't know. And that's how it started. Someone started calling me the conversion comedian, the UX comedian, and yeah, that's what I am. That's why they call me. That's how it all started. But there's more to it. Um, I'm in this business since 2001, and when I started, A/B testing was not yet available as a solution. Um, when I started, even Google Analytics wasn't available. So one of the only methods we had in those days was user testing. And I've done a lot of user testing uh, the past 15 years. And well, I will share some of my insights with you today. I did it for some clients, probably some of you will recognize, but well, that's enough about me. What will we be talking about today? We will start with an introduction. What is moderated user testing? What kind of things can you test? Where can you test? Should it be in a specific user testing lab or not? What are the main advantages? Why is it so valuable? After that, I will really go more in depth and giving you a side share, a lot of tips, things I learned, things I've done completely wrong when I started doing user tests. So, how to recruit the right users and how to make sure that they show up on the day itself. How to write a scenario that you have the right questions, that you ask the right questions to the participants. And of course, what to do on the day yourself. Um, what is your role as a moderator? Now, moderated user testing for me is one of the three key methods there are to make your website better. First one for me is the expert review. Um, and when, like I noticed, uh, a lot of you are uh, just less than six months of experience, you're not using any tools. Um, for me, an expert review is the basics. If you have not done anything to make your website better, start with a review of your website. Um, there will probably be some shitty things on your website. Um, maybe your website doesn't work well or it doesn't appear well in um, a certain browser or on a certain mobile device. And that is the basic for everything. Make sure that it works. And once you're sure that your website is nah, kind of okay, then it's time for some user testing. Of course, I will talk a lot about user testing. And it's only after that that, in my opinion, that you should start with a B testing. Don't get me testing is a fact to make your website. But if your website is shit, the result of A-B testing will just be a less shitty website. And I hope that's that's not our goal um, for our website. A-B testing for me is about refining the website. But if people can't find the product they want on your website, it doesn't matter if you're applying the right um, persuasion techniques. It doesn't matter if you have the exact right wording on your website. And for those things, A-B testing is good. User testing is good to make sure that people can find what they're looking for, that they understand what your website is about, that it answers their biggest needs. Now, a moderated user test is not a tool. It's a method. Um, the main characteristics are that you invite a number of people them certain tasks to perform on your website. Very important is that it's done on an individual basis. To a group where you have lots of people in one meeting room giving comments on your website. That is not what user testing is about. User testing is about observing people. So there's a questions and you're observing people while they're using your website or your app or your intranet or whatever. So those are the for me, the four main characteristics of a user test. What can you test? Well, ta-da, you can test your website. Whoa, what a surprise. But that's what most people think. Yeah, I can test my website or I can test an app, but most people don't really can also test the websites of your competitors. Um, well, not in the way that your goal to make those websites better, but, but you can learn a lot. When you see your target audience or people from your target audience, interact with the website of a competitor. What do they like? What don't they like? Where do they succeed and where do they fail? What features um, are plus and what features are they completely surprised with? So that you can learn and steal from your competitors only the best parts and leave out the things that don't work. So for me, it's very 
a very useful uh, method uh, to apply testing your websites competitor uh, your competitors websites third thing and that is also very important when you're making a new website or you have an idea of a new landing page or you want to some pages on the website most people think that they can only start user testing when it's finished that's what we what happens all the time even with our clients of course they we just launched a new website can you do a, a user test and it's like yeah we can do it but you probably foreseen um, the advantage in a wireframe and a big advantage is that it doesn't cost you a lot of money to change a wireframe it will cost you a lot when you want to change a final product. So test as early as possible. Big, big advantage of user testing. You can't do A-B testing, you can't do mouse tracking or user session recordings on a prototype. So in those circumstances, um, moderated user testing is one of the only methods available. Of course, nowadays you should test on every screen, not only on desktop, but also on smartphones, tablets, and so on. But that's pretty obvious, I think. When it comes to user testing, there are three flavors, three types of user testing. In-person user testing, guerrilla testing, and remote user testing. In-person user testing, that's the, the old school method, uh, but it's not outdated. It's still my preferred way to do it. What is it? The moderator and the participant are in the same location, they're in the same room. Your office, the office of the client, in our case, since we are an agency, it's the client's office. It can be a, a meeting room in a hotel. And the big, big advantage of being in the same room with the user is that you can observe everything he does. And not only the mouse movements, but his facial expressions. Is he smiling? I hope he's not crying, but maybe he's like, oh, what's happening now? You can see his body language, and as a moderator, you can interact on all those elements, and you can't do that when it's a remote user test. Of course, you can also add some eye tracking, but eye tracking, uh, it's a nice add-on, but it's not necessary. For me, most important thing, interaction with the user as normal as possible. Now, we also have guerrilla testing. Guerrilla testing, when it's that useful, um, Mainly when you want to do user testing, what they call into the wild. In the wild, um, for example, if you have an app um, for patients in a hospital, yeah, you should go to the hospital to do, do some user testing. If it's um, for, an, you have to go to the desk of the people using the internet to see it, to see them in their natural environment. Second example of guerrilla testing is when you have a broad target. You can go to where your people, uh, <laughs> where your audience is, uh, instead of go to a super mall, you can go to um, a popular place, a Starbucks, a, a pub, buy them a coffee, buy them a beer, and ask feedback um, on your, well, not ask feedback, do a small user test with them. So that's the main difference, that you go to the user instead of the user to you. Of course. Will also have, uh, or it, it doesn't ask a lot of time for your user. It doesn't have to travel to your office. So that's also a big advantage of testing. And the last flavor of user testing is remote user testing. Well, the title says it all. The moderated, the moderator, and the user are not in the same location. So this will also help you to um, be time um, efficient. So. You don't need to set up and meet a group. The participants, um, they don't have to travel to your office. Of course, when you want to test someone who is living in South Africa, based in Belgium, you need to go to your office for a one hour user test. So, in those circumstances, remote user testing is the only available solution. And third element, when we would prefer remote user testing is when the target audience is really very specific. If you sell clothes for acrobats in a circus, it will easier be easier to find them when they're not well, well easier to find them 
for a user test or free their time for a user test when they don't have to travel to your office. So those are the three flavors, three kinds of user testing that are available. Now, you haven't heard me talk about a test lab, and that is one of the biggest in the usability people still think you have to have a complete usability lab to do user testing. Well, that's not true. We have a lot of testing except in our early years in um, specially built labs. Some of our clients in the communication industries and banking industries, they had built their own testing labs. And what happened is really what is happening here on this floor. People were standing in front of the two-way mirror, making funny faces, making some smooth dance moves. This is like a lineup in a police station. Around their microphone, don't feel at ease, and that is one of the things of a user test: is make your user feel at ease. So you don't need a test lab. Believe me, we've done all our tests for the last ten years in meeting rooms, um, in pubs, markets, um, in offices. So don't worry if you don't have a test lab. Maybe be happy if you don't have a test lab. Now. User testing, I love it, it's very important, and I hope I can convince you to do it yourself. Main reasons why user testing is so valuable, well, believe me, I'm in this business for 15 years, and even I don't know everything. Well, I used to be a guy about maybe five, six years ago, we thought, yeah, I've seen everything, I've seen so many websites, I've seen so many user tests, just give me a website, I look in my crystal ball, and I will give you the solution. And then when we did a user test or an A-B test, it turned out that the solution was not working and maybe that something that was working on website A didn't work on website B. So you need to have data and user research or user testing is one of those methods to get data. If you don't believe me that um, even an experienced expert doesn't know everything easily by the smart guy. Easy to use and people will like to use it. Be the modern Spencer of tomorrow, where they spent what was it about 150 million British pounds, and they noticed when they launched it, they saw a drop of 8% in sales. We just had it a few weeks ago. We had a client, and it was the same thing. He said, "Carl, can you help us? We launched a new website, a new version, and oh, we have a big problem with sales." And we said, yeah, did you test it? No, we didn't have time for that, and it was not in our budget. And that is the problem. People are making things from an expert vision. They don't do testing, and when they go live, it sucks, or it's not as good as it could be. So please go out. Use your users. Talk to the people who will use your website, who will use your product. For those people that are using tools like Hotjar or the VWO suite and or Google Analytics, and they notice, okay, we have a bounce rate on this page, we have people dropping off on that page, people are not scrolling. That's what those tools will tell you, where the problems are, but most tools will not reveal why it is a problem, and that's also what you can do with user testing. First, use the tools to see where the problems are, then use user testing and input from real persons to see why it is a problem. If you're an experienced expert, most of the times you will know why it's a problem, but if not, user testing is the way to find out. And of course, you can also use it the other way around. You will see problems during your user test, people hesitating, um, making movements with their mouse because they're not sure where to click, people they don't understand text, so that will give you a lot of ideas to start with a B testing, to, to make hypotheses on which things to test. So it works both ways uh, around. But for me, the three most important reasons for the user testing is that you have facts against opinions. In every company, there are people who really believe that what they think is the right way. We have it all the time. When we do an expert review, as long as I give advice that the client also believes in, it's like, yeah, Carl, yeah, you're right. And when I say something that is against what they're thinking, it's, yeah, Carl, but that's just an opinion. And that's the advantage of user testing. It's an objective method. You see 
users struggling with things on your website and as a client and especially as a manager it's very hard to ignore those things if you have four out of six users um, struggling with uh, filter navigation or they can't find a product or they don't understand what the product page is about or, or how to order it, it's very hard to ignore it as a manager. And for me that is the most important thing of uh, user testing is the test we make a best of, well maybe it's a worst of, so we all people struggling with things. And we see that our clients use that all the time to convince the managers within their companies because you have to be a die-hard, ego-tripping, know-it-all director. Even those people, they will shut up when they see clients, potential clients, struggling with their website. So the power of a user test video clip when someone is struggling is huge. It's uh, the best thing ever and really do it and we see clients sometimes they use it one or two years after the user test they call say oh there was someone new in our company and he, he had a great idea but we showed him the results of a user test, the video and now they're convinced that it wasn't a great idea. So it's something that lasts for a very very long time. Now I think we're almost halfway the webinar. I'm thirsty, I'm gonna drink some water and right after this I will go to the real tips, real insights on how recruiting the right users, how to make sure they show up, writing the scenario. But um, I think you have a question for us. Oh, there will be a question soon. Yeah, thanks for that, Carl. Uh, our users can see the uh, our, our users can see the quick poll right now. Uh, would you like an offer from uh, select from any of the uh, following options? Would you like an offer from BWO? Well, someone from the sales team could reach out to you and you know explain uh, BWO and some of the awesome things that you could do with it. Uh, or would you like an offer from AG Consult and you know uh, someone from AG Consult would get back to you uh, uh, and give you some very good offers on uh, consultation and maybe more. Uh, let us know if you want an offer from both BWO or AG Consult or if you don't want an offer at all. Uh, the poll would be live for another 10 seconds after which we'll close the poll. Thanks for that. We are closing the poll now. Thank you so much for your participation. Uh, I let I I I let Carl do the talking once again now. Over to you, Carl. All right. Cool. So let's get this party started. Um, three things. I will talk about the next twenty minutes or so: recruiting users, making your scenario, and your job during the user test itself. It all starts with recruiting the right users. And you've probably heard somebody saying like, yeah, it's better to test with one person than with nobody. It's better to test with your mother than with uh, nobody. Well, I can assure you, don't test with your mother. Yeah, I've done it once. Um, the problem is, and especially if you're testing your own website, your mother likes you. She will never say, oh, this website is shit or I don't understand what you're what you're doing. So don't test with people you know. That is so important. <laughs> when you recruit users, you should make sure that they belong to your target audience or the existing or potential clients of your business. Um, what I so also like is not only have customers of my business, but customers of competitors because they can compare things. If I'm testing an app for a bank, banking institution, I love to have some clients from competitors because then they say, yeah, but on this app, the other app I'm using works like this. They can, can compare. It will give you very useful insights. Once again, I'm just repeating it. 
don't only test your own websites, but also test websites of competitors. And of course, you also want a good mix between gender and age and educational level, as long as they belong to your target audience. I think that are the most common mistake I see here, and that's with a lot of marketers, is that they become too much fixated on precise profiles. They want an exact mix that don't do it. And if you don't believe it, just do your first user test and you will see that the differences between ages, sexes and education are not that big as you probably assume they will be. If there's a problem with your website and it's, if it's a real problem, most people will have the same problem. They will not find the right solution. So do a user test, of course, do a good mix of your audience, but don't go out on the social demographic stuff. More important is when you have a list of possible candidates is that you do a screening. The first thing we do, we go to Google, we Google them, we go to LinkedIn and we see what they're doing. The one thing you would not like to happen is that someone shows up and he works for your competitor. That is not what you want. And another group you want to avoid, there are developers, IT people, designers, marketing people, uh, marketeers, communication specialists, copywriters, everybody who is involved in marketing, in making websites, don't allow them to participate in your user test because most of the time they will not act as a normal user but they will they want to show off their experience and they say yeah I don't like this and I don't like that but it's not about what they like they like it's about observing real people third thing <laughs> maybe a personal thing but we don't like to have people as a candidate that are teaching because most teachers and people teaching at universities, they also have the um, strange thing that they like to think for other people. They say things like, yeah, for me it's very clear, but I think that most people will have a problem with this. That's not what a user test is about. So do your screening first. And then, very, very important, give them a call. Speak to them in front, because the point of a user test is to have feedback not only observing them, but you want them to talk to you. So you don't want a person there who's mumbling all the time or speaks a dialect that you have no clue what he's talking about or people who are too shy, too shy to say something. I remember once we did a user test for, um, what was it, for the Ministry of Education and we had a 16-year-old uh, gentleman in his puberty. He didn't say a word for one hour, so that is not very useful. So talk to your users, see if they are useful people, well, useful, that sounds horrible, but they're able to say what they think. That's very important. So give them a phone call, do a short interview with them, ask some extra questions, and the way they answer, you can also feel if they're in for the money, and only for the money, or they're really willing to participate in your study. You, you don't want people sitting in a user test just waiting for the 30, 40, or 50 uh, box uh, quid that you want to pay them. So please also be aware of those things. Very important one, this one. Don't use the word test. If I say the word test, you're thinking about stress. Oh no, examination. And that's not what you want. You want people to participate in a study? No. You want them to help you to make your website better. That sounds so more relaxing. That sounds not really like fun, but it's more fun than, hey, do you want to test our website? So try to avoid the word test all the time. I know it's a bit stupid because we're talking about the user testing, but you shouldn't call it user testing when talking to possible uh, participants. I know you've seen this image two minutes ago, but it's very important the day before the user test that you call all participants again just to confirm the hour because the, the stupid thing is that you're sitting there all day and that three out of the five users don't show up because they've forgotten about um, the hour or the date or they couldn't find the location. So make it clear, make sure that you have contact with all participants the day before the user test. 
question that everybody always asks, how many people do we need? And then most of you probably have seen this graph, it's from Jacob Nielsen, it's about 10 or 15 years old, and if you read it, it's like, okay, if you have five to six participants, you will discover 80 to 85 percent of all problems within your uh, website or your app. Well, yeah, not really. It's, it's a good thing. We always test with at least five people, but like everything in usability, world, and marketing, it's like, it depends. If your website has a specific targeted audience, ah, five users will be enough because they will have the same problems. But when you have a very large audience, or maybe you're a company and you have professionals and private users, then I would go for 10 people, 2 times 5. If you're a government agency and everybody is a potential user of your website, you should probably go with more users. So it depends. But at least 5 people is a very good thing. It's very important. If you have less than 5 people, you don't have enough data to draw um, serious conclusions. Now, that being said, if you have enough money for testing with 15 people, I suggest you do a user test in week one, then you make changes, you do a new test in week two, changes and a new test in week three. Then you will always test something new. It will give you far better, much more better results than when you do three days, three consecutive days of user testing on the same website. You will really believe me. <laughs> After 10 users, you will probably not learn a lot. You will probably don't you will probably don't see many new things happening. So test five users, iterate new things, and it will work out good. How do you find users? Well, use your brain, <laughs> use your website, mail your newsletter subscription base, mail your clients, use social media, use your call center. If you have physical locations, um, use the notice boards available and most of the time you will see that it's rather easy to find people that are willing to participate especially if you do it in the evening or on Saturday during business hours it's more difficult to find the right users and there are specialized recruitment agencies around even in B2B and that is one of the things that surprised me the most when we started in B2B most of the times it's rather easy to find people willing to participate, especially in a remote user test. They, they won't travel to your location, but if you say not, hey, do you want to test our website, but hey, do you want to help us improve our website so we can serve you better, they will be ready because you offer them something they can help to make their business, their experience better. So B2B, not a problem. We've done user tests for um, surgeons, uh, people in the health industry, yeah, always not a problem. We find them. And of course, they give you something and you need to give them something. We pay people, and it depends from country to country. In Belgium, it's between 25 and 50 euros. Depends on the kind of qualifications uh, of the target audience. We sometimes give gift vouchers. We especially do that in B2B um, projects because, yeah, if you have a Formula One driver, oh, that never happened. But if the Ferrari drivers are your target audience, I don't think they will be pleased with 50 euros. But give them a box of a, of a bottle of very fine wine, and they will be happy to participate. So yes, you should give them something, but make sure that they don't do it for the money only. So that's the part about recruiting. Let's go to the next thing, and the next thing is ah, so important. Coming up with the right task, writing your scenario, and First thing, and it's with everything you do in life, please set the scope of the test. What are the things that you want to find out? What are the things that you've seen people struggling with uh, based on user session recordings? Problems that you've noticed in scroll heat maps, problems that you've noticed in uh, Google Analytics. Focus on those things. You can't, and especially when you have a big website, you can't test everything. So make sure that you have a good scope of your user test. Secondly, focus on the important things. Um, a user test should focus on the top tasks of the users. What are most people using your website for? And what are the pages that are most important for your business? What will give you more money when you improve those things? Or what will help you to reduce costs, like um, making the support pages of your website better? 
you don't have to optimize everything. The one little thing that the guy of the legal department really insists that people could need to find but nobody wants to find it, don't include it in your user test. That is not what user testing is about, that's not what websites are about in general. And then you have to make a list of possible questions, of course. Typical problems we see, <laughs> and the first one is, it happens all the time, is that people use or give the solution in the answer because they use exactly the same words that are on the screen. And I know that most people will probably not be Dutch uh, natives, but if you see this and I ask you the question, hi, can you book a city trip to New York? Then I think that most people will find the answer because it's right there in their face and it's using exactly the same words. So, Try to avoid those things. Don't give the answer in your questions. Second problem I see a lot with people starting um, with user testing is that their tasks are too specific or they are not relevant for the participant. Hi, book a city trip to Rome for Valentine for two people, please. That is a terrible question because probably the word city trip, once again, is in your main navigation. So you give them them a hint and then it starts. Rome. Why Rome? I just went to Rome. I'm not interested in Rome. Oh, I had some friends that were recently robbed in Rome. It seems to be a terrible town. Okay, first problem. And then second problem. The guy or girl is just divorced and then she starts crying. Oh, Valentine. Oh, no. I have no money in my life and I will probably die alone. And then you have completely other problems in your user test. There's nothing to do with the user test, but then you have to pay your attention to the user. So try to avoid all those things. A better question just would be, hey, would you like to go on a weekend? And where do you want to go? If they say, no, I, I don't like to go on a weekend, I don't like to travel, you probably did something wrong with your recruitment. But if you ask an open, more open question, people say, oh, yeah, I always wanted to see Barcelona. Oh, go ahead. And the huge advantage of this is that people are now involved in the task. It's becoming their task and not something that you ask them. And really, if you have a shoe shop and there's a guy like me sitting as a test user, I have size uh, 46, that's European size, and you ask me, hello, do you want to buy a pair of running shoes, size 38 in pink? I would probably think, now, what is this? Is this scanned camera or something? And once again, try to adapt the question to the user. If you really want to find me those pink shoes, and you have to say, imagine you have a niece or whatever. Maybe you should have done that in your um, interview before, and then you can adapt the question to my needs. So very important. Adapt questions to the user. Don't be too specific. Also ask, make sure that you ask your questions in a very natural way, plain language. Rehearse your questions. Practice them aloud. Maybe practice them with your mother or your girlfriend or your boyfriend, but that's just a practice. It's not a real test, but make sure that the day you do the user test, you're prepared and that you know what you want to ask. Because then it's the day itself, the moment of truth. That hey, you're relaxed because you are prepared. But being a moderator <laughs> is a bit more difficult than you would probably think. You have to be a combination of four personalities and you have to be a steward and the steward is something with patience, who's very good with people, who smiles all the time, even when people say the stupidest thing you've ever heard, you should make them feel at ease, relaxed and your job is to be patient. You also have to be Switzerland, you have to be a very neutral person, you don't want to suggest anything and you shouldn't sit there with faces that show that, oh, <laughs> that you don't agree with the user. You sh that's very important. You're just there as an observer. Um, it's not about you, it's about the user. You also have to be a scientist because, hey, it is a user research project. You're doing user tests, so the data should be as objective as possible. And finally, you're a reporter too because you're asking questions. And you probably have people following the user test or maybe next week you want to see the video again and a lot of users they point at the screen and say, yeah, I don't like this or I understand this and it's 
your task to make sure that when you look at the video again that you understand what they were talking about. So it's it's more difficult than most people realize. Now, very important, and probably the most important thing is make the participant feel at ease. They, every participant is a bit nervous. What is this about? What am I doing here? Am I right on the right location? And your job is to start with some small talk, offer them a drink, make them feel comfortable, and then explain what will happen. Once again, don't use the word test. You can help us to make our website better, our app better. Say what it's all about. Make it clear that you're researching the website and not the user. The user can't do anything wrong. If something, if it doesn't find something, it's the problem of the website, not of the user. So stress on those things. They're very, very important. Last one. Uh -huh. Even if you made the website, even if it's your child, you've been thinking about this new website for one year, you should tell the user, hey, I'm just a moderator. I'm not involved in building the website. Anything you say, go ahead. If anything you want to say, go ahead. You cannot insult me. You cannot flatter me. Very important thing. And then, when the user feels at ease, you go to the next element. And it's a short interview to learn to know the user, asking about his experience uh, on on the internet in general, with this website, similar websites. Um, use the data you know from the recruitment form, and this will all help you to make your test as natural as possible to adapt your questions to the user. And then, finally, we can start with a test. What we always try to do is to start with a familiar task or an easy task. If the user is someone who has recently used your website or a similar website, we ask them, hey, why did you use your website, our website the last time? Nah, and then he explained and say, okay, let's try to find it now. And then he's once again busy with something that he or she is interested in. Never start with a difficult task. Never start with a problem that you even you don't understand because then people will struggle with it and they will, after five minutes they will go like, oh, what am I doing here? Start with something easy. And then you have your scenario. Your scenario Remember, it's a guideline. It's not a straight jacket. You don't need to ask all those questions. You don't need to um, ask them as they're on your paper. Remember, adapt your questions to the user. Make them uh, make the user feel at ease. Make them comfortable. And if the user gives you input like, "Oh, I was always," imagine you have an e-commerce website. And say, "I always wonder what is your return policy," and then you say, "Okay." Let's find it out. If the user has a question about the website, let him find the solution. That is what you're there. You want to learn things about the website, how people interact with it. When someone fails, when someone is struggling with something, ask an easy question. If your phone number is smack on top of every page, just ask it. Hey, you want to call us? Where is our phone number? Give them easy questions because it's not an examination. The user should be as comfortable as possible. And then this one, for those people still hanging around, it's a secret tip, but it's an important one. If you have every if you ask your questions for every participant in the same order, the result will be that your last question will always be the one that was the most successful. Hey look, everybody could find this one. Yeah, of course, because everybody was already half an hour on your website. They probably knew the answer where to find it at the moment you asked the question because they're used to your website after half an hour. So it's very important to mix the order of your questions from user to user so that the final results are as neutral as possible. Not a lot of user testers, not a lot of moderators know this one. So really, this is a secret. So okay, you've given the task, and now, and this is the most difficult part for me, you have to shut up. You have the user to give the time to think, to express themselves, and even if they go completely the wrong way, just let them do. Because in real life, you are not sitting next to the user either. You will soon find out when you're doing a user test that indeed patience is a virtue. It's the most difficult thing for a lot of people. Um, I see it. A lot of people who start with user testing when they fail on something, it's they don't have the patience. And of course, your job is to ask additional questions. And 
what questions and when depends on the situation. But as I said in the beginning, interact with the user based on what they're doing, their behavior, how they look, how the facial expressions, what they say, how they say it. Ask little extra questions. And of course, I could be talking about this for hours. There's so much more I want to share, but uh, it's a webinar. I can't tell everything. How to respond to typical situations. How to deal with difficult users. Yes, sometimes you have a drunken user. Sometimes you have someone who is very shy. Someone, you have an older gentleman or an older woman, and she just wants to talk with someone. And then they start talking about, well, in Belgium it's all about the Second World War. Yes, if you're very old people, and how it used to be when they were young. How to deal with those users. When can you help the users? When are you not allowed to help the user? Um, can you do a post questionnaire after each task? Yes or no? Um, how do you make sure that the observers know exactly what's happening? How to make sure that you know when you're looking at the video clips what's happening? How do you take notes? Because you're a moderator, do you have to take notes at the same time? How to make sure that your observations and your conclusions aren't biased? Because, hey, you made a website, and let's face it, you can always ignore what you're seeing. Um, and how do you report on user testing? So there are many, many more things you can tell about uh, user testing. My advice, well, first advice is we have some open trainings in uh, London and Berlin the coming months. But secondly, even more important, after this webinar, just do it. Do a user test. Use the tips that I've given you and see if you're suitable or not to do a user test. Some people are, some are not. You will immediately see if you have the habit that when someone is struggling with your website and you want to take their mouse to answer the question yourself, you're not good in user testing. But believe me, most people are pretty good at it. And of course, you will find problems when doing a user test. It's your job to find solutions for those problems. And I know that you're all aware that you should never change something immediately. Do an A-B test. See if your solution is indeed a solution. Maybe it makes it work. So, so A-B testing is very, very important. Of course, you can use A-B testing to find problems. Uh, sorry, you can you have user testing to find problems, but they will not give you the solutions. Test your ideas. Test your solutions. And that is what I wanted to share with you. I hope you have some questions. I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much for that, Carl. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, most of the most of them are answered, uh, you know, by, via the uh, chat box itself. However, we do have a few questions that uh, you know uh, our users would like to ask you. Uh, how about okay. we take a one minute breather and then you know we do the Q and A session? How about that? Yeah, very good idea. Awesome. So yeah, let's just let's just get let's just sync up again in one minute. Thank you for staying back, everyone. And thank you, Carl, for presenting those wonderful insights. I'm sure our uh, entire audience had a lot of takeaways, a lot of key insights that they will put to good use. And I'm glad you made a very strong case for A-B testing, uh, all, the, all the testing initiatives. I think, uh, needless to say, VWO believes testing is very important. 
and uh, it's it's essential that you know uh, wherever whenever running moderated user, user testing campaigns it's uh, it's quite essential to keep ab testing them uh, most of the yes. questions were already answered you know like i said online <laughs> however there is one question that stands out that i would like to ask you uh, one of our audiences have uh, has has asked uh, the question is how important is demographic behavioral and transactional data during moderated user testing are there any specific red flags that i should look out for what were the two things the first, the first was demographic data yes demographic uh, it's demographic behavioral and transactional data i'll repeat the question for you how important is demographic behavioral and transactional data during moderated user testing are there any specific red flags that i should look out for yeah. so well in general like like i said the demographic data there aren't a lot of difference but it depends from of course in in each business exactly you are but uh, one of the things that i found very fun we've done a lot of uh, user testing for uh, high schools and universities and we had people from uh, Europe people from India from the states all participating in the user test and i thought there would be a lot of cultural and demographic difference but even what we see is that if people want to to reach a goal and that is what people do on a website you want to reach a goal that most of the times it doesn't matter your demographic uh, data even differences between countries are not that big especially not for user testing if you go to the more detailed things then a b testing is there because yes there are some uh, differences in in colors between cultures and, and and other things but when it comes to understanding your website and and user testing is about understanding the website and can i find my way around and do i understand the the the, the website we don't see a lot of differences uh, between uh, demographic backgrounds I think that is an answer to that part of the questions. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what do you know? Like while you were answering this question, we were hit with plenty of other questions that you know are gonna take uh, a bit of your time. So the first, uh, uh, first of the rest of the questions is uh, Jonathan asked, "What is the recommended size of the testing group again?" Maybe it missed that bit of information. Well, like I said, it. Test at least with five people because if you have less than five people, you're not sure because sometimes you will see yeah there was a problem with one user, but was it really a problem? If if you only test with two users, you will never find out was it a real problem or was it just that the user was wasn't paying attention? So you should have at least those five people. Um, I can tell you that in 80% of the cases or the clients, we will test with five or six people. It's only when the target audience is very broad when you have, like I said, uh, a, a very wide offering or you have professionals and you have a uh, private person, then you will need to test with more people. But my advice is start with five people, see if they have the same kind of problems, solve those problems, and then do a next iteration of your user testing. So most of the times five is enough. If you have enough time to 10 people, maybe 15, but really that sh you should only do that when your target audience is very broad or when you have a, a wide, wide, wide range of products and solutions to offer on your website. Well, uh, thank you for that, Jonathan. I hope that answers your question. Our next question is from Dragos who asked, how do we use user tests to find out if pricing is right? when we do not know if users actually need the product right now and when we really want to hear a fair price and not an incredibly cheap price. Yeah, that's a, a very good question. A very hard, <laughs> very tough question to answer. Um, user testing, in my opinion, is not uh, the right method to find those things out because indeed it's not their money they're probably not that interested in anything. So, and, and, and if it's about pricing and uh, product pricing, or see how much you can ask, I'm not the right person to talk to. I think it's more general marketing side. So there are other ways uh, to find out those things. But user testing, in my opinion, is not one of them. You can do some A/B testing, but that is so <laughs> dangerous because. Um, 
especially when people are not logged in, it can be that they see version A on their desktop and then version B on their mobile screen, and then they're screwed if they see two different prices um, <laughs> when they're looking for price. So I, I have no answer for this. I have to admit it. No clear answer for this. All right. Well, uh, Dragos, about the second question, yes, uh, there will be a user session recording. And uh, along with it, we'll be sending Carl's uh, set of, uh, entire set of slides to all the webinar registrants. And uh, I, hope, yeah, I hope you get your answers from that. Our next question is from Mike Wilms, who asks, to what extent can you, stimulate, can you simulate real behavior in a laboratory setting using user test? Haha, <laughs> very good question. So, um, and that is the most difficult thing. So, like I said, it's not a laboratory setting. So, what we <laughs> try to do because it's <laughs> the user test itself is not natural. So, we don't add any every other things. We don't have cameras. We don't have microphones uh, flying around on the ceiling. So, we make it as natural as possible. But indeed, the <laughs> It's not the normal user behavior of the person. Everything, and that is the most important thing, everything depends on the moderator. And that's why I stress so much on making the user feel at home, making him feel as comfortable as possible, and asking questions that he really, or give him thoughts that he's really interested in, so that he's motivated to find those things for themselves. If you have a user who says, yeah, I really need a new pair of shoes, and oh, go ahead, find a new pair of shoes, even if it wasn't included in your scenario, and if you're testing a shoe store, of course. But yeah, it's it's a task of the moderator. One of the things I noticed when we, we started with it, the laboratory setting was still very popular, and we always tested in the office of our clients, and we had a lot of people commenting on that. Now, one of the main reasons we tested at the office of the clients was that those days when we started, we didn't have our own proper office. And a lot of people were saying, yeah, 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 but that's so dangerous. People will feel very intimidated. Uh, well, I can assure you, if you have a good moderator, and please follow the tips that I gave in this webinar, the people will forget that he's doing a test because you never used the word test, and he feels good, and he will his behavior will be as natural as possible. Of course, it will not be the same. And I'm not saying that user testing is the only method available. Huh? Um, always, yeah, we use, uh, we always try to, to mix several methods. So yes, we do user session recordings, we do heat maps, and then we will do user testing. Then we change something on the website, we go back to Google Analytics, uh, we do a heat map, uh, another user session. So. You, you should mix those methods, but every method has its place, and user testing is about yeah, finding the real problems with your website. Like I said before, if you want to find out the right color of your button, or the best color of your button, the right wordings on your call to action, if you want to find out which persuasion techniques work best for your website, user testing is not the way to go. Then it's A-B testing. Awesome. Uh... In fact, Mike has a follow-up question to his previous question. Now, his follow-up question is, what is your reaction, Carl, when a client wants to observe a user test? You know, maybe in the same, or maybe he's in the other, maybe they are in the other room. What's your reaction? Oh, I love it. I really love it. <laughs> maybe not in the same room, <laughs> because then a participant will be like, oh, what is he doing here or she? Um, so one of the main reasons why we did user testing from the beginning in the offices of our clients was that we wanted our clients and uh, collaborators, the whole team, to watch the user test. So we always did it. We, we had two meeting rooms, one smaller room as cozy as possible with a window uh, for the user test itself. And then in the beginning it was just, we just connected the projector beamer to the laptop and we just mirrored the screen in the adjoining meeting room so people could see what happened. We had a, a very long audio cable so we could uh, send the, the uh, well, how do you say it, the voice of the user, you could hear it in uh, the meeting room. So that is very important. Please let your client follow the test because then he will see real people enjoying or struggling with his website. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, well, our final question uh, is again from Drago, who's asking: Now, is there a user session recording or a video with a user with a user that you could share? 
Um, that's a question for me. Is it a question for VWO? I think that's a question for you, Carl. Um, no, I don't have. At the, at the moment, we don't have any things we can share. But if you really want to know more about this topic, you should Google for um, Stephen Krug user test. Steve Krug, sorry, uh, user test. And you will probably soon find a 45 minute video of Steve Crook, who is pretty good at user testing, uh, doing a user test. So then you will see that what I was talking about is not rubbish, but it's the truth. So <laughs> it will help you. <laughs> well, maybe AG Consulting BWO should run some uh, moderated user testing of them. Uh, you know, them. Yeah, that would be a good idea <laughs> to share some things because, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, that's all the questions we had for you, uh, Carl. Thank you so much for patiently answering.